Hello, um, I'm Yuki Hanyu, the founder of Integrate Culture Company, also the Shoujin Meat Project, a citizen science community to culture a grow meat at home. And I'm just sharing the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay, orbit on deep space still the agriculture. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, um, uh, so it, uh, so my ventures with uh, with cell based meat started with Shoujin Meat Project, which is um, like um, a citizen science community who's growing meat at home. And we uh, Shoujin Meat Project basically publishes some like DIY manuals to grow meat at home, like that. And after from there. Um, and uh, uh, integrate culture company spun off, which is a um, cell agriculture startup developing a uh, like large scale cell culture system. And, op and it, the company is offering the technology to other and other companies so that anyone will be able to grow meat. And also we have another startup called Cell Agriculture Institute of the Commons, which is a kind of like a Japanese equivalent of New Harvest or Good Food Institute. And so today's topic is the um, space agriculture, but unfortunately, I have to put one disclaimer that uh, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, uh, currently uh, there's no peer-reviewed scientific publication on this topic yet. So uh, and um, the search words can be like cell-based meat in space or food grade large-scale cell culture in zero G or just things of that sort. So um, unfortunately, a lot of the content in this presentation is sort of could be said like original research. But um, we still need to start somewhere. So I, I would take it as an, like a positive note. So, um, so this, this is basically an open space. So that's where people's involvement would be, is wanted. So uh, cell-based meat has always been a um, um, topic of uh, popular topic in science fiction. So the, although the original idea was in around since the like 19th century. Um, um, it, uh, it, has, it has always been uh, only in people's imagination, and in, and the, the famous quote from Winston Churchill from 1932 or like 33, that's, um, that concept was already known, and since then we have seen this concept in many different uh, different works, and so some in like proper science fiction, some in uh, some whatever. Um, uh, internet meme like objects or uh, sci fi gadgets. So the idea has always been there. And there's actually a, a good reason why cell based meat tends to appear in science fiction. And because uh, we know that uh, a cow, which is about four to five, uh, which weighs five, four or five times more than men, and uh, than, than humans, um, would consume that times more oxygen. And obviously, if you go to space, um, oxygen supply is an issue. And on top of that, um, as talked by other, as talked by like, environment and environmentalists, we know that meat meat requires requires vast amount of agricultural resource with a huge environmental footprint, which is about like, forty times more than um, than soy is. Then, if you think about Mars colony. Land is like I mean, arable land is also quite scarce on on Mars. So currently we have zero, and in the future we could probably build something, but it will not be abundant. So there comes the uh, the uh, basic um, fundamental energy conversion efficiency of cell based meat. Yes, currently uh, the meat production goes on the on the upper route from starting from the sun and um, unregulated photosynthesis by the grass and the conversion efficiency is something 0.1% or even lower. And that fed into cow, which converts into converts grass into meat at about 4% energy efficiency. But if you go to a cell-based meat route, we know that um, uh, cell cultured meat can be turned into meat at 35% energy efficiency. And we also know that um, some organic, organic materials <laughs> Um, currently, uh, mainly from corn, as it can be converted into um, um, the culture, culture medium or like sugar, amino acids, or those materials at 50 to 90 percent conversion efficiency. And this is already done at an industrial scale. 
then we have um, means of producing this organic matter by algae and possibly in the future some artificial photosynthesis and the efficiency of this can be much higher than, than grass and if you close the uh, if we close the loop here from the sun from the sun to meat, then we, we have we effectively have um, an order or even two orders of magnitude uh, efficient efficiency efficiency improvement. And uh, another another way to look at this is that uh, is that a state systems is actually, uh, has has to be a closed loop system or, or otherwise um, it just doesn't survive. But it is actually we can also see this as a um, a trajectory going from the um, 1960s to um, uh, to the future. So it is basically the that basically the trajectory of going green from like uh, from resource consumption to uh, closed loop systems. And on the on the flip side is that you know, if you develop some closed loop, if you can develop a closed loop system originally targeted for space. It can be implemented on the ground for um, to build a susten sustainable systems. Then, um, and so we go. Um, another um, another advantage of closed loop system is that uh, basically the environment is we we can stop stop worrying about the environment. So this is an illustration of a like mid medium scale. Um, a meat culture facility, and that's that may be situated in the desert or polar regions or under sea or in space. So, so then, so that basically, um, you know, that sure expands the imagination to a whole lot of like outer worlds in science fiction. So from here, it gets more 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 into proper science. So so before going that we. Um, we should probably look at the difference between food in space and farm in space. So this is a uh, this is a study done by uh, JAXA, which is Japanese NASA, in um, um, in a, a public-private consortium called Space Food Sphere in Japan, and and this um, they uh, they uh, they've drawn three scenarios for the future, which is uh, which is professional visits and the first professional uh, professional live and also, and the, at the end like many commoners living in space. So three scenarios, and these scenarios are originally drawn by Mitsubishi Research Institute in collaboration with JAXA. So in the professional visit scenario, which is like as of now, um, about up to ten people will be living in orbit. And um, up to ten people may be on the moon. So, the, so what, what is what's meant by that is um, uh, some astronauts in this international space station. Possibly the uh, ISS, ISS could be privatized in the, in the future. And also, um, there's a lunar gateway and Artemis program going on. And that basically corresponds to up to ten people on the moon scenario. And in this in this in this case. Um, the what's what's expected for food is basically nutritional needs for astronauts to um, do work in space. So we will be talking about mostly talking about space food launched from uh, from ground. Then slightly further in the future, we have about hundred people in in the orbit. That's the, and about 30, 60, 60, 60 people on the moon. And that's basically when. Um, and that scenario corresponds to the times when space tourism, tourism is streamlined, and some there are some space hotels, and there are, there are some the occasional visitors to space. And there we we need to start thinking about producing food in space rather than launching from the ground every time, as people will be um, as more than up to hundred people will be living in space. And the living, um, living means like um, staying there for extended period of time, like half year, one year, or even longer. But mostly, um, but most people living in space will be professionals. And in that scenario, um, uh, what what is expected from food is mostly is still mostly nutritional needs. So we have to think about a very efficient way of producing uh, food. So therefore. 
vegetables we can probably use indoor farming but we have also have to start thinking about thinking about the protein so soy could be an option or algae or insect algae and insects could be an even more efficient option and because they're professional if that's part of the job they would eat it hope hoping that it's tasty <laughs> But in the, in the third phase, when many commoners, commoners start living, as uh, this food production in space will enter, it will have to enter a new phase because by that time, more than 800 people will be in, in the orbit as mass space tourism takes place. And two, more than 200 people living on the moon as, and, even, and even tourism begins by that time. And there, what we expect for food is not just nutritional needs, but we also start thinking about social and human purposes. As so, in in many culture, in most in most cultures, food or meals is is um, plays the role of the central hub in social interaction and um, human quality of life. And by that time. Food has to take that, those factors into account on top of nutritional needs. <laughs> then, so what are the options for space food then? So, so, in, so this is a study done by uh, um, um, earlier studies by done by NASA, and they basically listed up listed up the um, listed up what is listed up the requirements for space food, and especially if the food launched from ground. And they've uh, listed up some things like organolytic acceptability, nutritional efficiency, efficacy, and safety, and launch weight, waste mass, and such. And then, if you think about uh, how this would change if we go to uh, um, space farming, so not launching food from ground, but um, producing food in space, so organolytic acceptability will be more important, and nutritional efficacy um, is, uh, it is. It is desired, but because it can produce produce on site, um, it can be less less important. And space food has to has to stay for um, stay edible for three to five year period, especially if you are going to the, going to Mars. But if you can produce it on spot, it will be less less important. So, like we can imagine systems like indoor farm in orbital indoor farms. And launch weight, um, because it will it will be producing it on site. You see, you don't have to worry about it. Although you may have to worry about the um, a launch weight of the food production system and a waste mass. Um, a waste mass. A waste mass. It means uh, an edible part, including packaging. So if you if if you take that to space farming situation, so. It's it's never bad to have um, little waste, uh, but it becomes less important as it can be as it can be recycled for other purposes. And like micro micro g cook uh, micro g cooking uh, micro g cooking process, um, so it will probably remain important on the orbit, but well, the moon has although little has still has gravity, and pack, packaging mass so. Uh, it will be uh, less important in space farming situation. Although, as I've said before, it's always good to have uh, it, it's always good to have little packaging. And then um, we have additional um, additional considerations such as the facility weight and reliability and availability of in situ resources and also the waste to recyclability. And um, as I said earlier, um, there's no scientific publication on this topic yet. So uh, I will, uh, there, are, there are publications that mentions these, um, uh, these factors, but um, um, it's not something like when quantification is done. So that's basically the future work to be done. So, um, but, um, so, um, uh, JAXA, which is like Japanese NASA, have already done some um, some space farm space farming um, uh, studies. So unfortunately, unfortunately, not space cellular agriculture, but still just space farming. Then they basically then looked at uh, looked at this issue from uh, with um, 
two conditions, which is the con um, with uh, two circumstances, which is one is the construction of the farming environment, and the other is um, establishment of uh, establishment establishment of like um, life in space by sustainable agriculture. So these two are the um, conditions space farming um, have to um, space farming has to meet according to these studies. So. Um, uh, so all this um, study would be all this study is centered around maximizing like recycling of materials to support life in very limited resources. And in this study, um, the um, the picture on the left hand side basically uh, is um, is basically all you have in a uh, like minimum scale um, minimum scale fully uh, fully I will arguably fully recyclable space farm systems. So it's basically rice, sweet, uh, uh, rice, sweet potato, and a leafy green, a silkworm, salt, pond loach, and soy. So that, they, they, they've assumed 100 people living for 20 days, and, and they immediately spotted that plant-only diet causes deficiency in the vitamin D and vitamin B12, protein, cholesterol, and fats. So they introduced silkworm and pond loach to supply protein and fats. And, uh, and these... Um, and these products basically uh, makes a, a, a closed loop, um, a closed loop ecosystem that can be used to supply humans with uh, enough nutrients. Then we think about so if we have that, why do we need? Why do we actually need meat? And and that um, that's a quite an important question. Because um, at least in the immediate future, probably we don't need meat in space, and that is um, at least in the earlier times, it will be just highly, highly trained professional professionals going to space, and the priorities is in nutrition and other functional aspects of food. So, if you look at space food production from that point of view, well, all you need is basically microalgae or maybe insects. So, because they are more more functional at protein source, but if you look into uh, if you look into the further further into the future, where when like layperson and tourists in in the number of tens and hundreds going to space, then the priorities for space would go to uh, social well being, and where organoleptic and cultural acceptability would be more important, and then we start needing meat. So like this despite higher resource requirements than algae. So in a way, we can call meat as a necessary luxury. So yeah, so do we need meat now, not algae for now? Well, we need, we need, we start needing, needing meat in the future for reasons outside functional, uh, functional aspects. So like, um, so another way to illustrate is that so although Mars one was a bit of a well, corn or scan, um, at that sort of scale, you don't all you need is algae. But if you start seeing like massive scale uh, colonization, then that's when you start meeting, start needing, needing meat. But which is also makes which also makes sense because we know that uh, um, cell based meat production needs to uh, needs some scale to make it viable. So. So then we start comparing. We start comparing what we actually need for um, uh, cellular agriculture in, in space, and also other food options. So, so this uh, this table compares the um, uh, the points raised by NASA in the earlier studies, like organoleptic acceptability, launch rate, and nutrition, and so. And if you compare these, um, uh, com uh, if you compare on the. Um, um, how each food options do in, in, in each respective points, we can start thinking about so how, which which one to combine. So we, if we look at like um, launch fresh food, organ acceptability is good, but launch rate is heavy, so it's not very good. But it can be complemented by other options like yeah, indoor farm could be a good option there. And nutrition, indoor farm um, from nutritional point of view, indoor farm like uh, like some. Um, cholesterol and fats, so yeah, veggie only. So it can be uh, complemented by probably microalgae, fungi, or insect cell agriculture. And if you solve the puzzle, um, 
this is um this is one possibility so basically a uh, combination of indoor farm a uh, microalgae and cellular agriculture and uh, cellular agriculture has got um, one big problem which is the um, need for input biomass which is yeah culture medium but this can be um, supplied but supplied by microalgae and um, and also on top of that um, uh, other than meat, we we can also produce vegetable by like indoor farms, and which is, as you can see, the indoor farm is actually pretty good for uh, doing pretty good in in space. So we we don't really see uh, we don't see like um red box there. We have only one yellow box there, and this other um, and and um. Okay. And this uh, the system that consists of cellular agriculture, microalgae, and indoor farms can be from time to time and be supplied by uh, um, launched food um, or possibly in uh, in situ resources in the future. And um, uh, and this um, and um, as I mentioned. Um, and I mentioned that um, algae can be used as a, uh, the, as a culture, the raw material for culture medium. And this point has already been made in 2011 by the LCA study, LCA in, uh, by an LCA study. And, and that's, um, that's something that we can see as the holy grail of um, culture, meat, uh, culture meat production for cell agriculture purposes. And, and this, time, this timeline is, mm, um, is acknowledged by uh, integrated culture company and other uh, research institutions in Japan. And as of now, a culture medium a culture medium for cellular agriculture is basically produced by like mixing individual individual ingredients like each of twenty amino acids and glucose and vitamins. But in the future, to bring down the cost of culture medium. Um, um, Integrated culture company is working to use uh, digest, uh, digested yeast, uh, digested yeast residue, and this uh, the concept, uh, the basic concept. Of this has already been shown by the Shoji Meat Project in 2015, 2015 and 16. Uh, it's basically um, it's a food, it's a food, a food, well, it's food grade culture medium, or possibly better said as food culture medium, because it's basically digested food materials. So chemically undefined, but far cheaper. And further down the road, um, as basal basal medium or cultural medium becomes a commodity material, then we probably have to start thinking about converting algae into in cultural medium, and that's um, and that's where production of cultural medium at megaton scale would become uh, possible. And yeah, algae, pro algae production in the closed, closed systems has already been uh, looked at by NASA, and there's this um, there was this Omega project, which stands for offshore membrane enclosures for growing algae. So the original intention was to uh, grow algae for uh, fuel purpose on ocean surface uh, um, to uh, recycle um, recycle CO two and other nutrients. And the result of this study is is already published. So this is something that we can we can look at for food um, algae for the algae culture in space. Then if you look at um, so how, what's the actual efficiency of that like from conversion of algae into meat? So that and that has got um, so there's no uh, proper scientific publication on this yet. But we um, we know that uh, we know about. Um, some figures, and that's a combination of those figures, uh, figures um, appearing on top of publications. And according to according to those um, publications, basically the average per capita meat consumption is 130 grams per day. To and to produce that amount of um, cell based meat, the input required is 31 grams of amino acids and 63 grams of glucose. And and the amount of algae needed to produce that amount of um, um, amino acid and glucose is uh, calculated as 325 grams of algae. So, which means you need to produce uh, 325 grams of algae to uh, support uh, one person's um, daily need for 
for uh, for meat. And to do that in uh, to do to do that in space for uh, because it, because all, everything which things has to be recycled as much as possible. The input is most input for algae uh, most likely be like uh, wastewater and some sort of fertilizer. And that's basically, that's basically a work in progress. And conversion of algae into uh, cell uh, into culture medium for cell based meat has been uh, looked at by um, some researchers uh, under JSP uh, Mirai program, which is a um, like five year government program with twenty million dollars. Um, as, and, and that's uh, this um, this government program started in 2000, November 2018 in Japan. And it basically targets to produce cell cultured steak from algae extracted medium by 2024. And recently, I heard that in Europe, recently there was this uh, uh, need for all um, a, a project funded by EU government for like $3.3 million or something. And it's basically um, a Japanese equivalent of that program. And there's another study by, uh, by JAXA, uh, JAXA Tansa X grant. And it aims to establish algae and animal cell co-culture in a closed loop system with um, um, with food production system uh, with possible food production system in mind. And in, in this in this kind of closed loop system, algae growing in culture medium under elimination of ex to exchange oxygen and ammonia with, with with animal cells. So I I've actually seen the the bio, seen the and um, like an experimental bioreactor, and uh, it looked kind of odd because um, you see green things growing under familiar red colored culture medium. And there's already a publication from that study, and um, um, some of the key results include uh, includes um, extraction of uh, 0.15 gram of glucose from one gram of algae using um, using diluted sulfuric acid at 130 degrees. So pra uh, pra uh, practicality of using this particular process of sulfuric acid at 130 degrees in space is still a question, but at least it shows the concept of um, extraction, extracting glucose uh, from algae. And also uh, on the amino acid side, so Algae treated with one uh, one uh, one molar uh, one molar uh, HCl 100 degrees uh, basically produced hydrolyzed the protein uh, algae pro algal protein to produce amino acids, and they've tested the extracted extracted sugar and amino acid onto actual cell culture, and at least it showed um, it, at least it showed the um, possibility of of, um, of growing uh, animal cells using um, um, using amino acids and glucose extracted in, extracted from algae, and after after extraction of amino acids and glucose, we, then we start thinking about uh, building meat or more, or tissue culture or tissue engineering in space, and then that's where this the, this famous picture on the left, uh, like three D printing zero gravity three D printing is an option. Or it could, be, or there's all there's even a DIY option, DIY option of that, which is basically a foam sat um, loaded with an encapsulated um, culture dish. And um, although it didn't come to actual realization, there was a there was a high school student in in Shoji Meat Project who tried to build this thing. Well, unfortunately, he had to take some like uh, college entrance exam, so he quit the um, he quit his cha the challenge. <laughs> And, and and besides that, there's um, um there's this space food sphere consortium uh, that aims to uh, build food production system in space. So this is an officially a JAXA a JAXA sponsored program, um, along with other um, along with uh, multiple um, private enterprises. And, and this program basically. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, basically develops um, space-based food, uh, food production system and apply the technology on Earth um, to um, and to, uh, to build innovative uh, and sustainable food systems. And they look at uh, two things: so high efficiency closed-loop food supply system 
and also the, uh, these, these food solutions they improve quality of life and in packed up in a confined environment and they have got uh, they have some timeline for that uh, all, the, all the way down to uh, um, uh, 2100 so it starts with SDGs and um, and a transition to transition transition to space age and also expansion of human human habitat in space. And uh, they have um, uh, six um, have six working working area for that, um, such as um, indoor farms and bioreactor and like all and so. On. And and uh, each, and there. Are, and the sub consortium of com uh, companies and um, academic institutions for each of these six uh, six fields and integral culture company is actually on this uh, this field zero two like a bio food reactor and on the picture here you can see this uh, meat culture and algae culture happening at the same time and if you think about that sort of systems uh, and the, um, the question becomes the question is no longer just food, but you but we start but we start having to look into uh, element recycle or, or atom, atom economy of such systems. And, and there you have to look into how carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur and each of these elements recycle through the system, and including um, including food and non-food system, including food and non-food entities. And, and that is from the earliest uh, earlier studies by JAXA on like uh, uh, like like eating pond roaches and stuff like that. And they are also looking at the um, um, atom economy, atom recycle um, from this um, closed loop food systems. So you know, outside food, they have they have also looked at um, the um, uh, recycle recycling system for O2 and CO2 and also uh, things like um, calcium calcium and potassium and they had some interesting considerations such as um, uh, do some plants require bee for pollination that can be supply at 0 to 0 0.2 atmospheric pressure um, but uh, and on top of that um, this could become a um, um, uh, this could greatly help the food, uh, food um, any food system in the atom economy, which is the like in situ resource re re utilization, uh, which is basically like you know, mining resources on site. But obviously, that depends on um, where you are. So, because if you are on the moon, you may you possibly can get some water and hydrogen from ice in polar craters. Um, but, um, but the moon lacks. Uh, a lot of essential volatiles such as carbon and nitrogen elements so it has to be supplied from somewhere and but that that's not a that's not an issue for mars because you can get uh, carbon and nitrogen from atmosphere uh, or there's another option which is like um extinct comet which contains a lot of volatile elements and if you go to the outer outer uh, uh, um, moons of outer uh, outer planets like ganymede europa and pluto they bought, um, they bought um, all these volatile elements from uh, from the crust, and they can they can possibly be harvested to produce food. And from here on, it's basically the time for just fun imagination. So this is all solving the puzzle of what's available on site and what can be done and how it can be converted into various organic materials, including space. So you could think about production of wheat from Martian atmosphere, a mid-sized wheat brewery from for polar expeditions, or the like solar system from interplanetary spaceships and the conversion of Pluto's crust material into biomass, or even comet mining. And this is one of the one of the possibilities for that. And, and this that, that's basically a need for um, cellular agriculture facility on Mars, like hypothetical. So you can see you know, algae. An algae pond there, and also solar panels and um, the energy source. And in this kind of system, it, this is all just in, uh, just in my, in my imagination. And so that ex comments from experts are mostly most wanted. But um, food production, a, a food production system with atom atom cycle in mind, 
can look like this. So you on on this whole system, you see uh, food produced from, food produced by cellular agriculture as on the top right, and in this whole system, you see, part of that includes uh, intake of um, the Martian atmosphere for carbon and nitrogen. And on the, the bottom right, you see the, you see some low, in situ resources like potassium, sodium, potassium, sodium, and ice. And these can can be converted into um, fertilizers for algae. And that algae and and uh, 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 fertilizer for algae and some vertical farms or indoor farms. And that uh, they, uh, they both can be combined to uh, feed cellular agriculture. So that's one possible system. And um, there's actually a virtual reality YouTube video um, on, on, on this system. I made this video in 2016. Um, so in this VR, VR video, you can, you can find some like algae photobioreactor taking CO2 and N2 from the atmosphere. And there's hydrolysis of hydrolysis facility to convert algae into cell culture medium and the large scale cell culture um, facility. And this um, um, wastewater uh, wastewater treatment system, and to convert um, uh, to produce um, algae fertilizer, and there's also indoor farm. So that was on Mars, and there's another um, um, another imagine system on Pluto, and that that basically com uh, that. This facility, um, because it's on Pluto, you cannot rely on the solar power. So it's basically nuclear powered, and and the input of uh, input materials and most entirely cross uh, cross materials. So in a way, um, on Pluto you can convert uh, convert the ground or the convert the ground into biomass. So there's um, uh, there's uh, low temperature nitrogen fixation and hydrogen reformation going on. There's also electrolysis going on, and um, like the, like the technology developed by Solar Foods, there's hydrogen bacteria involved, and then there's also cellular agriculture. So there's that another possible system, uh, another possible food production system with atom recycle in mind, and but. But on my on my personal on my personal note, um, the sort of food production system I want to see in the future is this kind of thing, like a bench top on in everyday life situation, and even kids can do that. So, so in this picture, this uh, a younger sister went to went to went to the earth as a field trip, school trip. And got this wagyu cells as a souvenir, and growing a state from that back on Mars. And yeah, she although she does it, so everyone has to has the has the share of that. And well, these cells, her friends can can take a take a share and and grow in each of their each of their homes. So just this is a, a summary. So meat is a necessary luxury, and there is a, a preceding literature for space farming uh, with atom recycle in mind. And they suggest that the, there, there must be some combination of indoor farms and cell agriculture and, and algae. And the numbers work out as 325 grams of algae into 130 grams of cell-based meat. And the resource availability would depend on the location. And it will definitely affect the design of such food production systems. And uh, so that was uh, that's basically what I found for uh, this topic, and also what, I, what what we have been working on. And I'm open for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, this was was definitely a nice overview. And looking at my notes here. Earlier, we had a, a discussion about uh, when it comes to space, you think short trips, medium-sized trips, and then long trips. And I think uh, a lot of what we discussed here really touches those long trips uh, very nicely. And those are actually, um, I think, the most exciting and from imagination standpoint to think about. And the VR demonstration, I think the first time I saw that was at the New Harvest 2018 conference. Oh. Um, and it's it's interesting that now, two, two, maybe two and a half years later, we are now 
starting to see so many more outlets start picking up the idea of space, uh, excuse me, cultured meat in space. So that's, mm. that's super exciting. So um, qu questions are open now. I see that there's one question from Luis that we'll get to in a second, and I have some questions here. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, section. Um, I'll go ahead and answer Luis's questions uh, or uh, ask Luis's questions first. He says, what about legume trees in space, right? Legumes have high protein. Have ah. you thought about potentially having uh, uh, any types of nuts in space? Uh, yeah, so that basically falls in the category of uh, uh, indoor farms. And we know that we will probably need indoor farms in space. And we can probably um, produce um, protein with that. So that's basically like uh, going vegan in space. And that's definitely an option. Then, but then we go into the question of uh, um, all the social well being and organic and cultural acceptability. Because um, you cannot force everyone to be vegan um, in, in space, and especially in times when non professionals start going. We, uh, we have a, another question from uh, Anton who asks uh, why, in the future prospects slide, there were no rows about people on orbit and moon. Uh, or excuse me, there was uh, folk uh, pictures of people on orbit and moon, but Mars was not mentioned. Uh, and maybe there is a slide for Mars or maybe some thoughts for, for Mars, but any insight on that? Uh, yeah, so it's basically, it basically comes from um, this, ex, um, this future scenarios. So, uh, so 200 people on the moon and, but there was actually, in the original publication, there was actually a mention of Mars. Uh, it said about like 10 to 20 people on Mars, but because um, um, that, um, that that's basically uh, uh, equivalent. That's basically equivalent to like up to, up to ten people on the moon, or thirty to six people, sixty people on on the moon. And so, um, so basically, uh, um, it uh, yeah, twenty people on Mars in two thousand and forty-five is based uh, not basically the, uh, the same same as but twenty thirty uh, uh, but same number of people on the moon. So I omitted from here, but obviously uh, the, this timeline mentions only up to two thousand and forty-five. But if you go extend this line to two thousand and uh, twenty-one hundred, um, then we start. Uh, we have to start. Uh, we have to think about let's say like one thousand people on Mars. Great, and it's funny that you know twenty one hundred seems like it's a, a year that's very far away, but oh. it, it's only eighty years away, right? Let, oh. you know, a, a, an average lifetime away. So the the younger generation now will definitely get to that point, and maybe we yeah. will have that amount yeah. of people on, on Mars. So that's really exciting. I, I want to ask a question about um, water usage, right? Oh. Creating um, cultured meat will be very water intensive, right? And oh. so. Um, is there any way around that, um, and and will that kind of make it? I know it's like like this, uh, 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 like a, a luxury. Uh, what was the term you use? Uh, necessary luxury, I believe. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know what? You know what can we do to kind of make sure that um, we have that cultured meat sooner than maybe we have other things that are are water intensive? Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so um, as, uh, first we have to look at uh, where would people be in the future in space, and it's not quite, um, it's not very um, possible that let's say like thousand or even ten thousand people living in zero gravity open open space. So uh, that number of people will probably be living on some sort of surface, like lunar surface or Martian surface, and the. Um, and we also know that uh, for build to build like space settlements, the availability of water becomes one of the deciding factors. So, in, so if you look at them, um, in case of uh, moon, um, there are um, plans to build uh, bases around um, icy polar polar craters. So, availability of water is. Um, a prerequisite for uh, settlement anyway. 
So, um, and we, and what's most likely is that where there's water, there will be people, and that's that's where steel based um, steel based meat production is also um, um, viable. And we are seeing more and more uh, research mm. that indicates that there could be, you know, different yeah. types of resources like, you know, water on, on Mars. And that's always exciting. And I think we're only going to find more uh, yeah. exciting news that, that comes from that. So that definitely makes sense. And um, ultimately, comet mining is a, maybe an option. Right. And, and um, not that it was comet mining, but I think there was a successful trip uh, over the last couple of days. Mm. Uh, right. So that's definitely very exciting stuff. Uh, regarding, um, you mentioned that there needs to be more science-based um, evidence and, and mm. research for yeah. uh, for certain things. What, what do you suggest we can do to kind of kickstart that? I know that the government mental agencies are already doing a lot with prizes, yeah. and grants, but what other ways can we kind of get more scientific research in those areas? Um, what other ways? So. Um, no. So this whole presentation was to basically hint where to start, but I think one of the most um, one one of the most important things to that uh, to be done um, done first is basically the quantification some various quantification works such as like how many uh, how many tons uh, a facility or weighing how many tons is acceptable or not, or what sort of reliability do you need for such systems, and also uh, how how big such systems have to be and what's the conversion conversion efficiency is and all these uh, coming up with the, these numbers um, mean a lot I think right and I think the takeaway metric that you have on that slide was 325 yeah. grams of algae uh, and that's for that's that's daily uh, that's daily. daily so that's okay. a very rough estimate based on publications available as of now and this number has to be refined. Absolutely, yeah. But it's it's nice to have that starting point. Yeah. We have a question from Alita that um, I will just uh, read off and then we can assess it. So uh, mm -hmm. um, they ask, access to this spatial future uh, mm -hmm. and obviously to cultured meat will only be possible for those who live in first world countries and uh, formed mm -hmm. as a question. What will happen to people from developing countries in Latin America, Africa? What is your perspective in this appearance? Uh, for uh, uh, food, in, food in space? I would say, yeah. I think this is assuming a future where, let's mm. say a lot of people, I know that the numbers we were talking about were, for example, like settlements or colonizations of about like 800 people. But mm. let's say more and more people start not just doing space tourism, but actually mm. start living in space yeah. in, on Mars, for example. How mm. do you, I guess, um, how do we make sure that there's still a balance between those colonies and what's happening on Earth? Mm. Yeah, so that, that question is probably uh, uh, beyond the scope of food. It's more about the distribution of wealth and uh, the share of space resources. And uh, for those questions, uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot comment on that because that's basically beyond the beyond technology. So it will there, surely there will be some like um, politics involved, and there could be also uh, some like corporate powers and those uh, those arguments involved. But um, one um, one hope I have is what's going on in in Shoujimi project, so like DIY cell culture. And that basically, uh, the same principle it can work in space as well. So, um, so, so, so DIY cell culture in space, like in these pictures, is, is the uh, version of the future I want to see. And to do that, um, especially, um, to, especially today, uh, um, uh, developing technology in uh, uh, so-called third world countries or the emerging emerging economies and i think it's, it becomes quite crucial and like like avoiding the monopoly of technology in, by you know by first first world countries and um this kind of a diy a low cost cell, cell culture and the diy culture beat, uh, culture of meat becoming um more common thing since we talked a little bit about science fiction, I'll mention oh. that 
there was a reboot of the Swiss Family Robinson, but they were uh, in space, and and there was a scenario there where uh, only a, a portion of the population was going to this space settlement, and uh, wow. and uh, the story follows someone who kind of replaced uh, someone else that was supposed to go. So kind of thinking about these wow. things, definitely, yeah, much broader, but very interesting to kind of uh, think about and conceptualize. Now, um, if there are any other questions, please uh, put them in the chat. The last um, question I have is regarding the Mirai program that you mentioned. Can you um, oh. either go through that again or give us a little bit more detail about that? Because I think that was pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the JSD Mirai, uh, JSD Mirai program. Um, that is, uh, which slide is that? Um, yeah, so this uh, JST Mirai program uh, it actually started with started with some government officials uh, turning up on one of the Shoujin project meetings, and they were basically looking at uh, emerging technologies, and they found uh, they found found out about cell based meat uh, through Shoujin meat project, and we had conversations with them, and that was in I think 2017. And um, after a half year later, they basically came up with this uh, this project, uh, this um, government funding program. And um, the reason for uh, Japanese government to push cell based meat was to is to improve the food self self efficiency rate, uh, self sufficiency rate, or the, to improve the food security situation because Japan imports a lot of its food from outside. And the supply chain is uh, food supply chain is um, um, is fragile, so um, they had at least uh, they at least had some political reasons to push this technology forward, and they basically um, designed this pro this program uh, for, as five year program of twenty million uh, twenty million dollars, and in uh, in the first one year uh, the funding was this uh, funding was uh, was distributed to all. Um, four different groups and each group has got uh, at least one university or academic and at least one uh, um, a private company and we were one of them so we were a team of integrated culture company uh, um, with uh, Tokyo Women's Medical University and there was another group of uh, Tokyo University um, uh, teaming with Nissin Foods which is the uh, manufacturer of cup noodle and um, each of each of these four teams had their results and got things published and in the uh, enter the second phase and um, the team has been swapped around and now there's one team led by Tokyo University uh, and and um, and the JST Hirai program is awaiting on the second phase so um, the funding has. Um, uh, in this, um, in this part of this twenty million dollar total funding, uh, I think nineteen to eighteen. So most of the funding would go into the second phase, and the target is to um, make uh, one centimeter thick steak from algae extracted, extracted medium. And the goal, uh, the um, the goal here is two thousand twenty-four. Wow, that's exciting. Okay, so we'll definitely look out for more updates from that and. Oh. Uh, this next phase actually seems uh, seems like uh, we might see some very exciting news and, and updates. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much. I just kind of want to leave you uh, with the last thought that I was just very inspired by that uh, DIY kind of cell set uh, orbital cell culture experiment that never took off from the from mm -hmm. the high school student. Um, so so uh, maybe kind of looking into that, I think would be a, a next uh, a phase for me. Yeah, definitely su super cool. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. If there are any other questions, um, please put them in the questions for speaker Slack channel. Uh, and and uh, Yuki, if you can take a look there, it would be great to have you on. We're going to keep the Slack channel on for uh, about another week in case people have more questions. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this program.